Welcome back to Lab Rat Scientific. Now today I'm going to talk about the continuity equation and Bernoulli's principle and how it applies to generating aerodynamic lift. Now as usual, I'm going to talk about some physics, I'm going to crunch some numbers, do some experiments, and show some animations to give you some insights about how lift is generated. Now let's go ahead and get started. Before we begin, we need to understand the distinction between the pressure and density of a fluid or gas in a closed vessel, which is a static situation, and an open-ended tube where the gas is free to move, which is a dynamic situation. Here's an enclosed container. Now the molecules are free to bounce around in random directions and impact the four walls of the container, but overall they don't move in one direction or another. Now here's the open-ended tube. The molecules are free to bounce around in random directions and impact the sides of the tube. However, overall their direction is towards the right. So the gas moves through the tube. Now in aerodynamics, when a flow is subsonic or below the speed of sound, the air can be considered to be incompressible, meaning its density doesn't change. This might cause some confusion due to the fact that we know there are air compressors, which are used to fill things like scuba tanks and car tires. If we use air compressors on a daily basis, how can we say air is incompressible? Now let's take a look at a simple experiment it shows how the air density will change inside of a sealed container as I increase the internal pressure. Here's my experimental setup. I have two identical containers and they have the same internal volume. I can pressurize one of the containers and I'll keep the other container at the ambient air pressure. I'll place the two containers on a balance and compare their masses. First of all, I want to make sure the masses of the containers are identical. And so here they are both unpressurized. We see the balance is nice and balanced. I'm going to use the air compressor to put 20 psi of pressure in the pressurized container. And then place them on the scale once again. As we can see from the balance, the pressurized container is heavier. Now using the balance, it was determined that 0.7 grams of air was added to the pressurized container when it was pressurized to 20 PSI. Now I can calculate the density of the air inside of each container. The volume of each container is 0.0005 cubic meters. And the unpressurized air mass is the density of the air times that volume, or 0.0006 kilograms. Now if the pressurized container, which was pressurized at 20 PSI, of course, the volume is the same, 0.0005 cubic meters, but the air mass is the ambient air mass plus the additional air added, which was 0.0007 kilograms. So we see that the air inside the pressurized container has a mass of 0.0013 kilograms, and that's twice as much as the unpressurized container. So the density of the pressurized container was essentially twice that of the ambient container, thus proving that air can be compressed. Now, when we consider a moving gas that's not constrained by the walls of a rigid pressure vessel, the pressure of that gas can adjust to the physical constraints. Now, this pressure change prevents the gas density from changing. So we can say this moving flow is incompressible. Now, this moving flow introduces a new pressure element, and that's known as dynamic pressure. So a moving flow has both static pressure and dynamic pressure. And it's a balancing of these pressures is where it creates lift on an airfoil. The first thing we need to do though is look at the conservation of mass and how it applies to a moving fluid. An important point to remember is that conservation of mass in association with a fluid flow requires the flow to be steady, incompressible, non-viscous, and irrotational. This might make some sense a little later on, but for now let's just keep that in mind. To get started, let's examine the concept of mass flux. Now, experiments show that mass of particles passing any given point in an enclosed tube is the same all along a tube, regardless of the cross-sectional area of the tube. So mass flux is the amount of mass per second passing any given point in the tube. And we know that mass is density times volume. So mass flux is density times area times velocity. And area times velocity is the volume of fluid passing a point every second. So conservation of mass, as evidenced by experiments, 
says the mass flux does not change along the length of the tube, regardless of the area of that tube. So to better understand this concept, let's take a look at a simple animation. Here we have a tube represented by the blue lines. This tube has two different cross-sectional areas. Now the red dots represent molecules moving through this tube, and they're moving from the left to the right as depicted by the blue arrow. To simplify things, let's just look at 24 mass units. Now we have to remember that this tube is a three-dimensional object, so those mass units actually represent a volume moving through the tube. Now let's take a look and see what happens when these particles move through the tube system. Initially, they're moving relatively slow. But as they move through the smaller diameter area, the velocity of the particles picks up. Let's take a look at that again. We are starting off with a certain pressure pushing the molecules through the tube. They're moving along at a certain velocity. As the area decreases, the velocity of the particles increases. So why does the velocity change? Well, to understand that, we need to take a look at the volumes created by the sets of particles. Now, initially, the particles are stretched out in the vertical direction and are relatively narrow in the horizontal direction, but it creates a specific volume. Now, if we look at the particles moving through the constricted area, we see that the particles are compressed in the vertical direction. Now, since this fluid is an incompressible fluid, that means the density has to remain the same, so the particles need to stretch out in the horizontal direction. Now, those particles create a, another volume, and those two volumes are the same as per conservation of mass. Now, conservation of mass also says that the volumetric flow rate, or the volume that moves past a specific point in a specific amount of time, has to be consistent throughout the tube. So, initially, the particles have a certain velocity associated with that certain volume. Now, since the second volume is stretched out in the horizontal direction, that means the velocity has to be higher to move those 24 particles past the center point in the same amount of time. Now, let's look at this from a mathematical perspective. At the left-hand side of the tube, we have the mass flux of being density 1 times area 1 times velocity 1. And according to conservation of mass, that's equal to the mass flux at the constricted area of the tube. And that's density 2 times area 2 times velocity 2. Now, since the flow is incompressible, density 1 is equal to density 2. And thus, those fall out of the equation. The simplified conservation of mass equation becomes area 1 times velocity 1 is equal to area 2 times velocity 2. If we look at the units, we see that area is meters squared and velocity is meters per second. If you do some algebra, we see that that's meters cubed divided by second, which is volume divided by time. So what we get is volumetric flow rate. And according to conservation of mass, the volumetric flow rate is constant. If we look at the conservation of mass equation, we see as the area decreases, the velocity has to increase to maintain the equality. Now, we can do a simple demonstration to verify the concept of the continuity equation. What I have is a hose with running water, and I have two different nozzles. And I can check and see how far the water stream shoots out for the two different areas of the nozzle. Here's my experiment. Now, I had two openings for the hose, a small diameter opening and a large diameter opening. The area of the small opening was one half that of the area of the large opening. Now, initially, I have the small opening installed. And here's the experiment running. We see the distance the water stream travels. Now I remove the stopper and have a large diameter opening, and we see the distance that water travels. The smaller opening caused the water stream to travel twice as far as the larger opening. When the small opening was installed, the water shot out 1.0 meters. And with a large opening, the water shot out 0.5 meters. Now we calculate the average velocity of the water stream by dividing the distance it travels by the time it takes to travel that distance. The time factor is the time it takes the water to free fall to the ground. After all, it's a mass falling under the gravitational acceleration. The time it takes the water to fall of 0.74 meters from the experiment can be obtained by applying calculus to the acceleration due to gravity. By integrating acceleration to gravity twice, we see that distance is equal to one half times acceleration times time squared. We apply some algebra, we see that time is equal to the square root of two times distance divided by the acceleration due to gravity. Plug in some numbers, we see the free fall time of the water is 0.39 seconds. Now, we can calculate the average velocity of the water stream by dividing distance by time. The large opening, the distance was 0.5 meters, and the time was 0.39 seconds. 
This gives a water flow velocity of 1.28 meters per second. If we apply the same calculation to the small diameter opening, we see that the velocity of the water was 2.56 meters per second. Now from the experiment, we see that cutting the exit area in half will double the velocity of the water stream. Is this what the continuity equation predicts? The first thing we need to do is calculate the areas of the openings. For the small opening, which had a diameter of 1.05 centimeters, we see the area is 0.000087 meters squared. From the same calculation on the large opening, we see the area is 0.000177 meters squared. So the large opening has approximately twice the area of the small opening. Now I can apply the continuity equation. Area 1 times velocity 1 is equal to area 2 times velocity 2. And I want to calculate the theoretical velocity of the water stream for the small opening. So I plug in the appropriate numbers, perform a little bit of algebra, and I can calculate the theoretical velocity of the water stream for the small opening is 2.6 meters per second. So the continuity equation indicates the flow velocity associated with a small opening was approximately twice that of a large opening. So as the area decreased by half, the velocity doubled. Now you may have noticed that the experimental value wasn't quite the same as the theoretical value. So I did a simple mathematical sensitivity analysis to see if I could figure out where the discrepancy came from. Well, it was determined that the resolution of the dimensional measurements, which only had an accuracy of about 0.1 centimeters, could account for the observed error. So all said and done, the experimental value matched the theoretical quite well. Now that we confirmed that a fluid flow will accelerate as it moves to a region of smaller area, we can move on to see what happens to the pressure of that fluid flow. Now what we need to do is remember that a moving fluid has both static and dynamic pressure. Now the pressure of a fluid moving through a tube can be defined by Bernoulli's equation. And Bernoulli's equation can be derived by applying the work energy theorem to a fluid moving through a tube of varying cross-sectional area and height. This diagram will help us explain the derivation of Bernoulli's equation. Now recall that a pressure force is equal to pressure times area. So in the diagram, we have a pressure force, P1A1, pressing on a slug of fluid, trying to move it through the system. Now that pressure force is going to move that slug a distance of X1. However, on the right hand side, we have a pressure force pushing towards the left. So the fluid tries to move through the tube, the pressure force on the right causes a negative work to be done on the fluid. We also have a height change in the fluid from H1 to H2, so the gravitational work needs to be done as well. So if we look at total work of the system, we have a pressure force and the distance on the left minus the pressure force and the distance on the right, and that's a negative work, so it's depicted here as negative. It's negative work because it's forcing against the motion of the fluid. Then we have the work associated with lifting the fluid from height H1 to height H2. So the work of the system is P1A1 times X1 minus P2A2 X2 minus Mg times H2 minus H1. Let's simplify the system by looking at a horizontal pipe. So there's no change in elevation. So there's no gravitational work being done. Now what I have is a pressure force pressing on a slug of fluid. It's moving at this distance. And since all the fluid in the tube is moving, this slug of fluid also moves. But since it's a larger diameter, its distance it moves is not as great. Now by definition, due to continuity, both fluid elements have the same volume, mass, and density. So our simplified work equation becomes P1A1X1 minus P2A2X2. Again, there's no gravitational work being done. Now we know that a volume is the area times the distance that slug moves. So it's area times distance or A1X1. Now we know from continuity that A1X1 is equal to A2X2. We should also know that volume is mass divided by density. Or we can write that as M divided by rho. Again, so we have two expressions for volume, A1X1 and M divided by rho. So this allows us to rework our work equation. Work of the system is equal to P1 times the mass divided by density minus P2 times mass divided by density. And since mass and density are constants, there's no subscript assigned to those values.
Now, from the work energy theorem, we know that work done on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So we said our work equal to 1 half mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. Form a little bit of algebra, we see we get P1 minus P2 times mass divided by density is equal to 1 half mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. So now if we divide each side by m and multiply each side by rho, we get P1 minus P2 is equal to 1 half rho v2 squared minus 1 half rho v1 squared. Now we rearrange to group like subscripts and we get P1 plus 1 half rho v1 squared is equal to P2 plus 1 half rho v2 squared. This tells us that P plus 1 half rho v squared is a constant and that is Bernoulli's equation. P is known as the static pressure of the fluid flow. 1 half rho v squared is known as the dynamic pressure of the fluid flow. And the combination of P plus 1 half rho v squared is known as the total pressure. So Bernoulli's principle says the total pressure in the system must remain constant. So this means the static pressure must drop when the dynamic pressure, or the fluid velocity, increases. Here's our flow tube again. At the left-hand side of the tube, we have a static pressure and dynamic pressure. As the flow moves through the constriction, the velocity increases. The dynamic pressure gets higher. In response, the static pressure gets lower. Once we get through the constriction, the static pressure and dynamic pressure return to the initial state. Now let's take a little closer look at the dynamic pressure. Again, dynamic pressure is 1 half rho v squared. The dynamic pressure represents the kinetic energy of the fluid flow. If a fluid has no velocity, there's no dynamic pressure. Now, while the static pressure acts in all directions, the dynamic pressure acts in the direction of the flow. So dynamic pressure isn't really sensed unless you try to block the flow or cause it to stagnate. So here's a diagram showing static pressure and dynamic pressure in the directions they act. Now, if we look at the wall of the tube, we see that the velocity of flow normal to the surface is zero. And zero velocity means there's no dynamic pressure. So there's no dynamic pressure acting against the wall. The surface of the airfoil is like the wall of the tube. If the dynamic pressure were pushing on a surface along with a static pressure, in other words, the total pressure, lift could not exist because a pressure imbalance would not occur. Here's a fictitious diagram showing dynamic pressure and static pressure acting in the same direction. Now we have the ambient air pressure in the green arrow pushing upwards and the total pressure pushing downwards. Now, theoretically, when we increase the dynamic pressure by increasing the fluid velocity, the static pressure should drop as the dynamic pressure increases. However, the total pressure of the system remains constant. So the downward pressure force is equal and opposite the upward ambient pressure force, and no lift will be generated. Now, if we assume that dynamic pressure is acting parallel to the surface of the airfoil, we see the only forces coming into play in their vertical direction are the static pressure acting downwards and the ambient pressure acting upwards. So we see here that we have a force imbalance causing lift. Now, if we increase the velocity of the airflow, we increase the dynamic pressure, and the static pressure drops to keep the total pressure constant. And thus, we would see that a higher lift is being generated as dynamic pressure increases. Now, let's apply the continuity equation and Bernoulli's principle to the flow over an airfoil. But the first thing we need to understand is the concept of streamlines. A streamline traces the path of a particle as it moves over an object. Here we see the velocity of the particle and tracing it along, and that line makes up the streamline. Now, in a steady flow, streamlines cannot cross one another. However, they can influence one another. In other words, act like a wall of a tube. Now, all gas molecules in the flow will follow one streamline or another. The gas molecules will have the same speed and direction as they pass each specific point along a streamline. That's depicted here. As you learned a little bit earlier, lift is due to low pressure on top of the airfoil. And that low pressure has something to do with the velocity of the flow. But what's causing the velocity to increase over the top of the airfoil? Well, one common explanation is the equal time hypothesis. And that says when two particles encounter an airfoil, they split up and have to meet at the back end of the airfoil at the same time. And since the top of the airfoil is curved in a longer distance, the particle over the top of the wing has to move faster. 
However, wind tunnel tests show that this is not the case. The flow on top of the wing reaches a trailing edge first. Here are some images from a university smoke tunnel demonstration. The smoke traces out the motion of the particles. And from the sequence of images, we can see that the particles going over top of the airfoil are moving faster than the bottom. We see that the particles over the top of the airfoil are getting to the trailing edge sooner. This debunks the equal time hypothesis. So two questions come to mind. Why does the flow follow the contour of the airfoil? And why does the flow move faster over the top surface? Well, let's take a look at our streamline in a particle. Now, Newton says that a particle or an object is going to move in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. So here's our particle. We tend to want to move in this direction. However, in reality, the particle moves towards the surface of the airfoil. So this means that some imbalanced force must be applied to it to get to move in that direction. Now, the only forces that might exist are frictional forces and pressure forces. And frictional forces would make the particle move in the horizontal direction. So some sort of pressure imbalance must exist. Now, as the particle moves horizontally and thus away from the airfoil surface, it leaves a void. This void creates a small vacuum which pulls the particle towards the surface. As a result, the particle tends to follow the airfoil contour. We see why a streamline near the surface of an airfoil follows a contour. But why does the pressure decrease? Well, to understand this, we have to look at the total system of streamlines flowing around an airfoil. To understand what's going on, let's take a look at two more images from the smoke tunnel tests. First of all, we see that the particles do follow the contour of the airfoil as expected. And here we see that the streamlines seem to be compressed as they move over the top of the airfoil. Here's a simplified diagram of the streamlines. And we need to remember that in a steady flow field, streamlines cannot cross one another. A group of streamlines is called a flow tube. The diagram only shows four streamlines making up a tube, but in reality, there are many streamlines contained within that tube. Now you can see that the cross-sectional area of the flow tube gets smaller as it passes over the wing. And this is due to the outer streamlines constraining the inner ones. As the area of the flow tube gets smaller, conservation of mass as the flow will speed up. And Bernoulli's equation says as the flow velocity increases, so is the dynamic pressure. And since the total pressure must remain constant, the static pressure will decrease to balance out the increasing dynamic pressure. And this low pressure creates the lift. Up to now, we've been looking at the airfoil with its bottom surface parallel to the streamlines. And that's not usually the case. When an airplane flies, it usually has an aerodynamic angle of attack. Now what happens is that angle of attack deflects the airflow downward, and that creates a different form of lift. Here's an airfoil, that zero angle of attack. Now the continuity equation and Bernoulli's equation state that low pressure will be generated and some lift will be created. Now if we apply an angle of attack to the airfoil, gas molecules encounter the bottom of the airfoil and are deflected downwards. Now according to Newton's third law of motion, action reaction, as the gas moves downward, the airfoil responds by moving upwards. So this is the high pressure component of lift. Here's an interesting demonstration that is related to Bernoulli's principle. It involves a hairdryer and a small styrofoam ball. Here's my hairdryer shooting straight up. I place a small styrofoam ball in the flow and it seems to levitate. I can even tap on the ball to try to push it out of the flow, but it tends to want to remain in the airflow. So why is this occurring? First of all, why is the ball levitating? And why does it want to stay in the vertical airflow? So to explain what's going on, I revert to my simple animation. Here I have my hairdryer blowing upwards. You see the ball suspended in the flow. Now the high velocity flow coming out of the hairdryer provides ram air, which creates an upward force. And as the air curves around the ball, it separates on the top and creates a small low pressure region. And that also sucks the ball upwards. So it's those two forces that keeps the ball elevated. So it keeps the ball in the column of air. Well, as the ball wobbles back and forth, it modifies the streamlines. If the ball moves far enough, the streamlines create an inward suction, and the high pressure on the outside of the stream creates an inward force, and the ball returns to the airflow. And if the ball moves in the opposite direction, the opposite occurs, and the ball gets sucked back into the airflow once again. 
So it's these forces that keep the ball elevated and keep the ball centered in the airflow. And this is related to Bernoulli's principle. Now there's one more demonstration that's commonly used in the classroom, and that's blowing over a piece of paper. Now there's a lot of debate out there about whether that actually depicts Bernoulli's principle. Well, I'm gonna do some experiments, I'm gonna do some explanations, and I'll let you decide for yourself. I decided to use a hair dryer instead of blowing over the paper with my mouth. And I tested the airflow above and below the paper. And you notice there's not a whole lot of difference in how the paper behaves. Now, if Bernoulli's effect was coming into play, you expect the paper to be stuck downwards when the flow was below the paper. However, it doesn't. So this is the basis for the debate on whether this actually demonstrates Bernoulli's principle. Now, one of the arguments is, is as the air blows over the curved paper, it attempts to follow the contour of the paper, and as before, it creates a small vacuum which sucks the paper up. So it's not really Bernoulli's principle that's coming into play. To test this concept further, I used a rigid piece of cardboard with no curvature. And I did it in a vertical direction so gravity wouldn't come into play. From the experiment, you can see that the cardboard responds to the direction of the airflow. As I pull the airflow away from the cardboard, the cardboard responds by rotating. So the question is, is this Bernoulli's principle or is there still some kind of separation going on here which causes the cardboard to respond? So what's happening here is I have my hair dryer. That hair dryer is creating a flow tube. And the flow in that flow tube has velocity. And thus, the static pressure in the flow tube will be lower than the surrounding air. And if I move the hair dryer, the cardboard responds. Now, the only way the plate or the cardboard can move is if it's being acted upon by an unbalanced force. This means the pressure must be lower on the side with the airflow. But again, the question is, is this Bernoulli's principle or simply separation of flow? I'll leave it for you to debate and figure out what you think is going on. And that was a pretty complex discussion. And hopefully I didn't lose you along the way. Now, when I was in college studying aerodynamics, I didn't have the luxury of being able to understand the fine nuances of concepts like the continuity equation and Bernoulli's principle because I was too busy doing homework and studying for tests. Now, hopefully, I've given you some insights to help you understand those basic concepts so you appreciate how lift is generated from a theoretical perspective. Well, I hope to see you next time at Lab Rat Scientific.